Hi, everyone. We're going to get started with our webinar. Uh, so this webinar today is Cannabis Edibles and Cannabis Cafes, a Literature Review and Environmental Scan. I'm Greg Penny. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Canadian Public Health Association, and I will be moderating the webinar. Uh, just some housekeeping. So just before I introduce uh, our two speakers, um, this uh, webinar is part of the series of cannabis webinars the CPHA has held over the last uh, year. And uh, our focus has been on normalizing the conversation and not consumption or not normalizing consumption. So our two speakers, Michelle Kilborn is Michelle is the AHS oh, sorry, Alberta, Alberta Health Services Cannabis Project Coordinator and the Health the Healthy Public Policy Analyst in Population Public and Indigenous Health at Alberta Health Services. She's provided leadership to help identify potential health impacts of cannabis legalization and develop public education messaging to help reduce the harms of cannabis use. And Jason Mummy, Jason is a research officer in provincial addiction and mental health at Alberta Health Services. He provides research and evaluation support at different units across Alberta Health Services. Jason was the lead researcher on this cannabis literature review project. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jason and Michelle. All right, thank you for that introduction, Greg. Um, so as you just heard, my name's Jason and I'm joined by my colleague, Michelle, and you'll be stuck with me for the first half of the presentation today. And then I'll hand things over to Michelle. But before we delve into the presentation, I'll bring everyone up to speed on Canadian cannabis edibles regulations. So currently in Canada, the sale of cannabis edible products is illegal. Individuals can make cannabis infused foods at home, but it's illegal for anyone to buy and or sell them to the public. In December of 2018, Health Canada published proposed regulations for the second wave of recreational legalization in Canada, which will cover additional cannabis products such as edibles, extracts and topicals. And those regulations underwent a public consultation process, which ended in February. And now Health Canada is reviewing the responses. So according to Health Canada, this second wave of legalization will be taking place at a date no later than October 17th, 2019. And once this second wave comes into effect, cannabis edibles will be permitted for legal sale in the country. So in, in anticipation of future regulations, today we'll be providing an overview of findings from a report we produced regarding the regulation of cannabis edibles and cannabis cafes. So I'd be remiss not to mention a brief disclaimer before we get started. Um, this research is a literature review and environmental scan only, and it's not intended to suggest any policy, regulatory, or other such directive approach. And of course, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters, being Michelle and I, and do not necessarily represent those of Alberta Health Services or the government of Alberta. And I just wanted to acknowledge the team that made this report possible. A big thanks in particular goes to Ashlyn Sawyer, who had a crucial role in data collection and report writing. So thank you. So here's an overview of today's webinar. We'll begin by going over the objectives of the report, describing the methodology used, and then moving on to the juicier part and discussing some of the key findings. So objectives. Um, overall, the purpose of the report was to provide a review of current research literature regarding cannabis edibles and cannabis cafes and an environmental scan of regulatory practices in jurisdictions that have legalized recreational cannabis. So specifically, the objectives of the report were to provide an overview of cannabis edibles. And really, the, the impetus here is that there's a lot of confusion over what exactly edibles are. So we wanted to define them first and foremost and then go into some details regarding prevalence rates, adverse effects, and how edible ingestion differs from the more traditional administration method of inhalation. We also looked at labeling and packaging requirements of edibles in other jurisdictions, as well as food safety standards of edibles. So looking at topics like the production process, the preparation process, testing for pathogens, and THC content levels. Um, we also looked at current practices regarding cannabis consumption of all product types, not just edibles, in cannabis cafes. And this is a topic receiving a lot of attention right now in the news and a major gray area at the moment. And finally, we wanted to look at if the sale of edibles at farmers markets are permitted in other jurisdictions. So moving on to the methods. 
Um, to inform the findings of the report, we conducted a literature search of both research literature and gray literature for each of the aforementioned objectives. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the term gray literature, um, it simply refers to materials and research that are unpublished or have been published in non-commercial forms. So some examples include you know, government documents, uh, technical reports, white papers and evaluations. Um, so searches for research literature were conducted in a number of major bibliographic databases, including PubMed, Medline, CINAHL, Embase, and PsycInfo. And a variety of search terms related to cannabis and edibles were used. And these terms were coupled with terms related to food safety, cannabis cafes, public health, and a number of other terms. And the search itself was limited to English language peer-reviewed research articles from the last seven years, so from 2011 to 2018. And as I mentioned earlier, a search for gray literature was also undertaken. So a number of websites of relevant organizations were searched, including the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as well as a number of government websites in Canada and abroad. And this was supplemented with a Google search, which used the same search strategy from the database search. And finally, the literature items uh, were evaluated for relevance based on their title and abstract or introduction, and full text copies of relevant items were retrieved and appraised. I believe after the initial search, we had about 150 articles, potential articles, and we whittled that number down to around 50 for the final report. So secondly, we conducted an environmental scan to investigate how other jurisdictions uh, with commercial sales of cannabis have regulated edibles and cannabis cafes. So jurisdictions within the U.S. with policy regulations that closely resembled Canada's future recreational cannabis laws were chosen as potential interview sources and specifically states that both legalized personal use of cannabis and legalized the commercial sales of cannabis products, including cannabis edibles, of course, were selected. And you can see in this table that at the time, um, Vermont and the District of Columbia were excluded as current laws prohibited commercial production and sales. Uh, Maine and Massachusetts were also excluded as legalized commercial sales had not yet come into effect in those states. So please note that Vermont legalized the commercial sales of cannabis edibles right at the end of our data collection period and was therefore not included for that reason. So the final states matching the criteria were Alaska, California, Colorado, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. And if we were to conduct the scan today, that list would also include Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, and Vermont. And I should mention that there are a number of states that may potentially legalize cannabis in the near future, including uh, New York, Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Minnesota. So for any future studies, uh, we'll have a lot more jurisdictions to choose from. So interviewed representatives were from a wide range of state departments, which give you an idea about how states have approached regulation differently. So we can see that the cannabis regulatory body in Alaska, for example, was housed in the Department of Commerce, Community and Economic Development. In California, it's in their Department of Health. Um, in Colorado, Nevada, it's in their Departments of Revenue or Taxation. And in Oregon and Washington, it's a part of their liquor control boards. So it's interesting to note, at least for any Albertans listening, that Oregon and Washington are similar to Alberta in this respect, as the cannabis regulatory body in Alberta is the Alberta Gaming Liquor and Cannabis Agency. So some limitations to consider. Um, due to time constraints, a systematic review of the literature was beyond the scope of the report. And as the purpose of the report was to provide an overview of current literature, the include studies were not thoroughly assessed for quality. Also due to time constraints, only jurisdictions from the US that had implemented recreational regulations around cannabis edibles were chosen to be included in the, in the environmental scan. So as I mentioned earlier, Vermont legalized the commercial sale right at the end of da data collection and was therefore not included. Um, I should also mention that the information gathered from the environmental scan was meant to provide a broad overview of specific cannabis edible regulations, and it does not extensively describe every jurisdictional regulation as they are illustrated in their full policies. And finally, the, the policies and regulations discussed in the report are current to, to July of 2018. 
And given the fluidity of cannabis laws, these may have changed after the draft in the report. So please keep that all in mind as we discuss the findings. So moving along to key findings, we'll see that the findings are here grouped into five sections. Um, and you can see that these groups align with the objectives that I mentioned earlier. So I'll start things off by discussing the first section about understanding edibles, and then I'll hand over the reins to Michelle to discuss the remaining sections. So beginning with understanding edibles, start with a simple question, what are edibles? So cannabis edibles are food products made with cannabis flower or extract, and they can contain entire leaves or very finely ground material, semi-refined material like hashish or resin, or moderately to highly refined cannabis extracts and concentrates such as hash oil. And unlike other methods of cannabis administration, you know, such as smoking and vaping, um, edibles are not associated with issues of odor and stigma because they can be consumed inconspicuously. And for these reasons, among others, edibles have emerged as a popular and profitable area of the legalized cannabis market. So as you can see, edibles come in a wide variety of forms, including baked goods, butters, oils, hard candies, gelato, gummy bears, and beverages that can be prepared commercially or at home. And really the proliferation of edibles has given rise to an industry of continual innovation. Not only has it led to the widespread availability of more conventional um, edibles like baked goods, but an explosion of new products has occurred in the past few years. So for example, products as varied as THC infused water and coffee, mouth sprays, breath strips, capsules, um, beauty products, and even pet food and chew toys for family pets are widespread. So an already robust edibles industry will undoubtedly continue to grow as more product and consumption options emerge. And I can tell you, it was quite the eye-opening experience to search through cannabis, uh, disp um, cannabis uh, retail websites in the US. Um, the scale and diversity of the products was really staggering. Um, but a, a common misconception about edibles is that they are food products that contain the cannabis plant materials used for smoking. In reality, the cannabis extracts often used in edibles can be significantly different. So there are hundreds of chemical constituents in the cannabis plant, including approximately 100 cannabinoids, which is a type of chemical compound that causes the drug-like effects in the body. And most people know about THC, which is one of the most well-known cannabinoids found in cannabis and is the primary psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. So basic methods of cannabinoid extraction include heating the flowers from the female plant. And this process is called decarboxylation and it helps convert non-psychoactive constituents into psychoactive ones like THC. So by combining decarboxylate cannabis to oil or butter, the oil or butter becomes psychoactive and it can be used in cooking to create cannabis edibles. Now tinctures, which are an alcoholic extract of cannabis, can be also created by decarboxylate cannabis. So instead of oil or butter, it's mixed with alcohol for a set amount of days and tinctures can be placed into a dropper and used by itself or added to you know, a multitude of alcohols, beverages and foods. And alcohol beverages that contain cannabis can also be made by infusing the plant leaves and stems. Uh, and for example, teas may contain entire cannabis leaves or very finely ground material of the plant. And it's important to remember that as many of the compounds have been removed and non-psychoactive constituents have been converted into psychoactive ones, edibles may contain high levels of THC and only a small amount of the cannabis plants as other constituents. And as a result, there can be substantial variation in the amount and homogeneity of cannabinoids included in an edible product, which makes it difficult to control how much THC is actually consumed. And often this is why edible products seem stronger to consumers and it helps to explain why THC quantity uh, in homemade edibles can vary even more than commercially produced products in terms of potency and long lasting psychoactive effects. So moving on to some prevalence rates, uh, before I discuss these Canadian specific rates in the slide, uh, I'll touch on the US briefly. So edible cannabis products appear to be fairly popular in the US within legal cannabis markets. In Washington, uh, a state representative we spoke with from the Liquor and Cannabis Board indicated that the market share of liquid and solid edibles in the recreational cannabis market was 9% in 2017. 
And in Oregon, a representative reported that the market share of edibles and tinctures was 8.7% in 2017. So remarkably similar rates between the two states. And while these figures may seem low, it's important to take into account that the purchase of cannabinoid infused oil or cannabis to make homemade edibles is not reported as an edible sale. So the actual figures may be higher. And now there hasn't been much research regarding prevalence rates of edibles consumption in the US, but a 2014 national survey of adults found that around 16% of current cannabis users reported using edibles or infused beverages over the past month. And other studies in the US have shown that edibles appear to be particularly popular with baby boomers and medical cannabis users. Although it's important to remember that some US states do not recognize or allow smoked forms of cannabis as a medicine. So it's really difficult to paint an accurate image of consumption rates and usage trends in the US at the moment. Uh, but enough about Americans, let's move on to some Canadian content here. Um, allow me to draw your attention to the first column of findings here about adults. And this is from the National Cannabis Survey reporting on the second quarter of 2018. And the survey asked Canadian adults who reported using cannabis in the past three months about the types of products they used during that time. And data showed that the dried flower and leaf was the most popular at 86%, followed by edibles at 32%, and other popular products such as liquid concentrates and cannabis oil cartridges, which are used in vape pens, both came in at around 20%. And if you look at the right side of this slide, you'll see a gender analysis of this survey. And we can see that higher percentages of women reported using edibles than men. And specifically, 26% of male cannabis users reported using edibles compared with 41% of female users. And although it's not shown here, the opposite was true for using dried flower and leaf as 90% of men and only 81% of women reported using those products. So it's interesting to note that there are clear cannabis product preferences among men and women. And I should mention that the results of the National Cannabis Survey are released quarterly. So it will be fascinating to track any differences in responses over time, especially after the second wave of legalization comes into effect. Now, moving on to the youth data on this slide, this is from the Canadian uh, Student Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey, which found that nearly a fifth of Canadian students in grades seven to 12 reported using cannabis in 2016, 2017. And among students who used cannabis, smoking um, was the most common method at 80%, followed by edibles at 34%, and vaping at 30%. And it's not shown here, but dabbing was at 22%. And then uh, drinking cannabis infused products was the least reported method of consumption among students uh, coming in at around 14%. And approximately 25% of students who use cannabis also reported using another method. So around a quarter of students are using multiple methods of cannabis consumption. And continuing with the youth theme, um, a recent study in the U.S. found that the longer legal cannabis laws have been in effect and the higher the retail outlet density in a jurisdiction, the more likely youth will try edibles. And this same study also found that allowing home cultivation of cannabis was associated with an increased likelihood and younger age of onset of edibles use. So moving on to a comparison of ingestion versus inhalation. Um, although edibles are commonly perceived as you know, safe and an effective method of achieving the psychoactive effects of cannabis without exposure to the potential harms of smoking, there really is a lack of research examining how ingestion of cannabis differs with other methods of use. So when ingested, cannabis edibles are absorbed by the stomach and limer, liver and then enter the bloodstream and other parts of the body. Um, during inhalation of cannabis, THC is passed from the lungs to the bloodstream and blood then carries THC to the brain and other parts of the body. And it's not shown here, but there's another common method of administration, which is oromucosal administration. And this is when substances are applied under the tongue or in the lining of the cheeks, like in sprays and tinctures. And in these cases, the substance enters the bloodstream directly without going through the gastrointestinal tract. So now the, the onset of psychoactive effects from inhalation typically occur in minutes, whereas the onset after ingestion can take a couple of hours. 
And the effect of ingesting cannabis usually lasts between 4 to 12 hours, whereas the effects of smoking cannabis last only between 2 to 4 hours. Now, some studies suggest that the onset and duration of effects after oral mucosal administration are si similar to those of ingestion, although there hasn't been much research examining this topic yet. And it's also important to note that these times are approximate and can vary significantly depending on the consumer and the product being used. So on to the last slide in this section regarding adverse effects. Um, people that use edibles, particularly novice ones, can have trouble predicting what kind of effect will occur and when it will occur. And this delayed effect may cause consumers to eat more edibles to achieve the desired effect, which can result in adverse health outcomes. Now, delayed effects can also convince you know, a consumer, for example, that they feel safe to drive when in reality they risk driving impaired. Also, because an edible product may contain multiple dose units intended to be ingested in multiple doses over time, Accidental consumption of the entire product can result in overdose in adults and even be life-threatening for children. Now, according to studies from Colorado, the majority of healthcare visits for cannabis intoxication are due to edibles use, and overconsumption of edibles in adults is associated with an increase in emergency department visits resulting from severe agitation, nausea, vomiting, panic attacks, and anxiety. And children exposed to edibles are more likely than adults to experience severe respiratory depression, which can lead to uh, airway compromise or even risk of aspiration. So clearly edibles present a risk for children, especially in jurisdictions with legalized cannabis where edibles are more accessible. And edibles are often sold as you know, baked goods, candies, and other appealing products. And children are often unable to distinguish between cannabis-infused products and non-infused products. And this has resulted in an increase in emergency department visits for childhood cannabis exposure in certain U.S. jurisdictions. So evidence suggests that accidental exposure to cannabis may become more common as legalization of recreational cannabis comes into effect. For example, the average rate of cannabis-related visits to the Children's Hospital in Aurora, Colorado increased from 1.2 per 100,000 two years before legalization to 2.3 per 100,000 two years after legalization. And of the cannabis products responsible, nearly half were edibles. Also, the annual Colorado Regional Poison Center pediatric cannabis cases increased by more than five times from 2009 to 2015, and edibles were involved in over half of the cases between 2013 and 2015, which is when legalization came into effect in that state. Um, so that concludes this section. I'll now hand things over to Michelle, and she'll begin by discussing food safety standards. Great. Thanks, uh, Jason. Let's uh, just make sure everybody can hear me. Um, so I'm just going to continue along on some of the key findings. Um, so I'll start with food safety standards. And as you know, contaminated cannabis can pose a serious risk to public health. Um, cannabis species are susceptible to infection by a host of contaminants, which is why testing for mold, uh, mildew, pesticides, and other pathogens is important. Um, other safety considerations include enforcement, THC content, uh, food restrictions, storage conditions, and uh, food handling practices. I'm just going to briefly touch on a few of the ways that the other jurisdictions in this review are addressing uh, safety standards for edibles. So starting with food safety enforcement, uh, our eScan revealed that the current ways that cannabis edibles are being regulated is heavily impacted by the specific state department responsible for regulations. For example, in California, they exclusively rely on the public health department to oversee edible regulations, and they view them as neither food nor drug. So instead, edible products are regulated by their own standards based on current food and drug policies. Washington, Alaska, Nevada, and Oregon, uh, they regulate cannabis more like a food, uh, and they rely on partnerships with departments that regulate food products and food safety standards such as the Department of Agriculture in Oregon, Washington, and Nevada. Colorado uh, regulates edibles similar to alcohol, and, uh, but this is a shared responsibility between their Marijuana Enforcement Division and their Department of Environmental Health. 
So looking at uh, maximum THC content, uh, you can see here by this table that uh, four of the six jurisdictions allow a maximum THC content of 10 milligrams per serving and 100 milligrams per product. And Alaska and Oregon have more conservative regulations with 5 milligrams and 50 milligrams. Um, most states said that THC levels were decided through collaborative stakeholder consultation with industry, uh, health professionals, and consumers, uh, as well as lessons learned from other legalized jurisdictions. Um, moving on to food restrictions. Um, when we when we talked to the jurisdictions, all of them that, all the jurisdictions that we interviewed, they required that edible products be processed in separate and distinct facilities um, from conventional foods that don't contain cannabis. Um, restrictions around um, uh, specific types of food that are allowed to be infused with cannabis also varied from state to state. So, for example, Colorado, Oregon, Alaska, and Nevada. Uh, they have some of the most relaxed restrictions. Um, only Colorado restricts the addition of nicotine and alcohol to edibles, and only Oregon restricts meat products from being infused. Um, Alaska restricts only infused butters, oils, and fats, and items that closely resemble familiar drinks or foods such as candy. Um, I should mention that all six jurisdictions included uh, or indicated that they have additional restrictions on products that are appealing to children. So products can't be made in the shape of an animal, insect, car, human, cartoon, uh, superhero, hero, things like that. Um, looking at time temperature controlled products, um, there were varying restrictions across the streets regarding foods that are time temperature controlled. What I mean by that are obviously uh, foods that require refrigeration, freezing, or, or hot holding. Um, so Alaska, California, and Oregon, they allow for time temperature controlled products, but only in specific types of edibles. Um, California only allows things like cannabis infused water. Nevada allows only infused butters and oils. Uh, Washington, it was stated that um, actually, no cannabis edibles uh, can be time temperature controlled, so they have banned those uh, outright. Uh, moving on to testing and quality control and product recall. Um, all jurisdictions have testing and quality control processes uh, that includes independent testing and random audits. Um, so when we asked them about edible product recalls uh, due to mildew, mold, uh, pesticides, uh, or other pathogens, all six jurisdictions indicated that there had been no recalls specifically related to pathogenic contaminants. Um, although there were no edible recalls directly attributed to pathogens, five of the states did mention that recalls of edible products for other reasons have happened. Um, so some of the reasons were included uh, banned pesticide use, uh, misreported terpene levels, and uh, THC levels being misrepresented. When we asked them about home prepared edibles, uh, none of the uh, jurisdictions said that they had guidelines uh, or had created guidelines for consumers on how to prepare home edible products. Um, most of the states, or almost all the states, said that they didn't have the authority or responsibility to inform or direct consumers on how to prepare uh, edibles. And looking at public, public awareness and, and standards, so in terms of that public education and awareness campaign, uh, all the jurisdictions reported that public health was responsible for public awareness about laws and health information. Uh, whereas the cannabis boards and commissions uh, provided legal, legal, legal information, licensing, labeling, packaging, and required warning information to stakeholders. Okay, so as we know, um, looking onward to packaging and labeling requirements, um, we know that overconsumption and pediatric exposure is a risk with edible products, so it's important to have packaging and labeling requirements to help lower that risk. Now, although some states did not begin with strict packaging and relabeling requirements, such as maximum amount of THC uh, per product uh, and a clear separation of each standardized serving, uh, most have done so uh, done since. 
So um, generally, it is accepted that packaging and labeling, along with public education, can help inform consumers about the possible risks of edibles and help prevent accidental ingestion. So you can see here, when we're looking at um, uh, required warning information from uh, all six states, um, you can see here on the summary table, it's generally consistent across all the states in that warnings are required on edible packaging. Um, and some exceptions exist for uh, universal symbols, intoxicating effects, and required health risk warnings. Um, Alaska and Nevada are the only states to not use a universal symbol, but representatives from both states revealed that the adoption of one is currently being discussed. For packaging requirements, you can see that with the exception of opaque packaging, uh, most states are consistent. Um, individual servings in multi-serving packages must be indicated or a cutting guide be included. Um, products must be in child-resistant packaging and in resealable packages, either as they are manufactured or as they leave retail sites. I should note that uh, California and Colorado only require resealable packaging if there's more than one serving of the product in the package. Um, four of the six states also require that edible packaging makes no claims about any therapeutic benefits associated with the product or make any false, misleading, or over-exaggerated claims uh, or comments. So with labeling requirements, you can see by the table that there's some variation in labeling requirements across the jurisdictions. Uh, all six jurisdictions require that edibles include an ingredient list, uh, the total amount of THC in the product, and a unique ID or batch number. Um, nutrition facts panels are required in California and Oregon, and expiration or best buy date is required in Colorado and um, on perishable items in Nevada. Uh, three of the six states also require edible labeling to include disclosure of pesticides, uh, with Washington only requiring it to be part of their accompanying materials they provide to consumers at retail stores. So that kind of rounds out some of the key features of regulations related to packaging and labeling in the six states. Um, what I'm going to do is now um, in this next section is briefly discuss our findings regarding cannabis cafes and farmers markets, um, as well as uh, cannabis social clubs. Um, so in some jurisdictions, um, there is interest in, in permitting formalized spaces such as cafes and lounges to provide access to cannabis for adults uh, consumption. Um, these are licensed establishments that allow the use of legal cannabis by adults on the premises and in some cases permit the sale of cannabis products <clears throat> for use on site. So of the jurisdictions interviewed, for the most part, all do not permit cannabis cafes. Um, there is an exception in terms of California and Colorado who indicated that cannabis cafes are somewhat a gray area in their cannabis laws. Um, in Colorado, they mentioned that because local and state jurisdictions have the responsibility of enforcement, cities like Denver uh, have been able to pa pa pass bylaws allowing for establishments that are BYOC, so bring your home cannabis. Um, in California, representatives mentioned that uh, these types of places have been permitted in a couple of cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, and they are regulated by their own Bureau of Cannabis Control, so not a state-level um, um, initiative. Um, on this topic, we did go outside the U.S. and looked at the Netherlands uh, as well. So um, the Netherlands, often perceived as a mecca of cannabis, uh, is quite a unique case. Um, although the cultivation, supply, and possession of cannabis are criminal offenses, there is the policy of tolerance that evolved into what is known as cannabis coffee shops. Um, tolerance of coffee shops reflects the Dutch's uh, drug policy objective of preventing consumers from entering uh, the illegal drug market. Um, since their inception, uh, cannabis coffee shops have faced increasing restrictions. Uh, nuisance, nuisance issues, including traffic problems, noise, loitering, um, as well as a large number of tourists this became problematic over time, and in response, 
um, policy measures were implemented to relocate coffee shops away from city centers and in some instances were closed by local authorities altogether. Um, Canada's coffee shops are licensed by municipalities and are subject to strict conditions, uh, including age access, co-sale and co-use of other drugs, uh, controls on advertising and marketing, and a zero tolerance for public nuisance. Uh, nearly two thirds of Dutch municipalities do not permit cannabis coffee shops. And the total number of coffee shops in the Netherlands has gradually re been reduced from 846 in 1999 to where it currently, where it is in 2013 in, is 614. Um, I should note that in 2018, uh, The Hague, which is the third largest city in the Netherlands, uh, banned public consumption of cannabis altogether. Now to round out this section related to consumption facilities, we explored what are referred to as cannabis social clubs. Uh, cannabis social clubs are typically nonprofit associations uh, of cannabis consumers that self-supply and self-organize. Although individual uh, cannabis social clubs have their own unique designs, the general criteria includes uh, that there must be an official registration, um, only adult nationals or res residents uh, can be members. Um, there's a fixed annual limit of cannabis, and the only purpose of cultivation is consumption. Uh, cannabis social clubs exist in several countries with varying cannabis legal frameworks. Most notable are Spain, Belgium, and Uruguay. Um, advocates of this model think that these clubs provide a safe environment for peer-delivered harm reduction practice and where consumers have direct control over product quality and consumption. Uh, detractors are concerned about hidden motives and that under-regulation can result in poor quality control practices. Uh, nonetheless, the non-profit nature of the model suggests that clubs are not incentivized to increase consumption among members, and this enables public health policies to help educate members about product quality, harm reduction activities, and other issues related to public health and safety. And our last set of findings relate to farmers' markets. Um, all of the jurisdictions included in the eScan do not allow for the sale of commercial edibles or home prepared edibles at farmers markets. Why is this? Well, most of the issues are in and around public consumption bans, uh, a concern for public safety, uh, presence of minors, uh, and the modeling behavior and uh, around that issue, absence of security, and of course, control and monitoring. So our key informants shared some lessons learned uh, and described many successes and challenges that each of their states have faced in the legalization of edibles. So I'll just go through uh, some of those. So starting with successes, um, it was mentioned that the existence of a medical cannabis system before the introduction of the recreational system was beneficial. And this was because it, make it, that it wasn't a new drug, it was just a new consumer market. Uh, they thought that the pre-existing system brought recreational cannabis regulations to a higher standard. Um, all the states mentioned that there was a large amount of interstate collaboration among jurisdictions. Uh, specific success factors contribute to this process included uh, leaning on the experience of others who did it first. Um, also, uh, creating opportunities for early feedback and regulatory drafts and collaborating with experts. Another thing they noted was that the industry of non-medical cannabis always has new and evolving parts, and pretending to know all the answers or operating in silos or expecting a distinct endpoint, uh, this can cre create unintended and additional challenges and barriers. Um, it was also identified that learning from mistakes and being adapted as the industry grows is really important. And they also discussed how they were expecting more negative reactions to um, particular labeling and packaging restrictions uh, from the manufacturers and retailers, and they found that the overall reaction was actually positive. Um, they also felt that the maximum THC limits would be met with more pushback than they experienced. Um, again, it was not. Um, and all state officials agreed that enacting more conservative regulations at the beginning was important to success and added that uh, approach, approaching policy making cautiously is easier than having to create new or emergency regulations after negative experiences occur. Um, 
Um, some of the challenges and setbacks the key informants mentioned revolved around you know, steep learning curves, regulation confusion, responsiveness to the industry, and balancing priorities. Um, they described the sort of culture shock that occurred when recreational cannabis markets became legal. Uh, many of the representatives felt that all cannabis-related regulations fell under the authority of their department of division, and although they had experience with either drugs, food, tax, licensing, or public health regulations, few felt that they had a complete grasp on all of them combined. At the same time, differing levels of education and experience in the commercial or illicit market, as well as different regulation perceptions and backgrounds, meant there was a really steep learning curve for all jurisdictions and industry members as well. So this meant at times a uh, consensus on certain regulations and policy decisions about the new edibles market sometimes proved to be more difficult uh, due to the newness uh, of the industry, complexity, the fast-paced nature of the market, uh, collaborative efforts like stakeholder meetings were needed to generate buy-in from government agencies, industry leaders, and the general public. Um, the, the, the ability to be proactive in regulating cannabis edibles also proved to be challenging when considering public health and safety, um, keeping the public safe, particularly those under the legal age of use, was one of the most important considerations while developing regulations around edibles, but required regulators uh, to balance making legal products available in a safe manner, too. Um, other examples uh, that were mentioned include balancing labeling and packaging restrictions with maintaining readability and clarity, um, adherence and accountability among production and food safety standards, uh, as well as accountability in sampling and testing guidelines. So overall, edibles have become a popular product in the legalized cannabis market and are uh, a profitable industry for manufacturers, retail outlets, and jurisdictions. Uh, this review and environmental scan provided information from the legalized states that helped us better understand the complexities of legalization of edibles and other regulatory issues that are relevant to the second phase of legalization in Canada. Um, I should note, note to the audience uh, that Alberta Health Services has more information about the health effects of cannabis, uh, lower risk use guidelines, um, uh, it, it, research uh, about cannabis, and that is housed on our specific cannabis web, website, uh, drugsafe.ca. So thank you very much for your time and for listening. Um, and now I think we have uh, some time for questions or discussion. Great, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Michelle. I'm just gonna transition screens, everyone. Um, just so you have either the chat option or the Q&A, and uh, if you pose your questions there, I'll, I'll relate them to uh, Michelle and Jason. So I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit. So I guess the first question is around the availability of your report. Is it publicly available? Will it be available? And if so, uh, do you know when that would be? Yeah, it won't be publicly available at this time. I just, uh, if, you, if you weren't aware, there is an election in Alberta right now, so we will not be able to um, release anything publicly uh, until uh, after the election. And I think the follow-up to that in terms of the slides, um, we will be posting this on YouTube, and I think we'll be able to share the slides uh, after the election has happened so that'll be in in two weeks everyone so we will be able to do that so in terms of um maybe i'll start uh, a little more at the end here in terms of uh the this part michelle went through is so are coffee shops being considered in canada from your understanding um and i guess that also applies to um you know farmers markets based on your literature review are you aware of those at this point so in, in Canada, Canada public, oh, go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. Okay, so public consumption is a provincial and municipal matter in Canada. Um, I know that a significant number of municipalities in Canada have already outlawed public consumption of cannabis, and many of the cities that do intend to allow some public use have imposed or plan to impose uh, strict rules about exactly which public spaces are legal and which forms of cannabis are legal to be consumed in those spaces. 
Um, so in a lot of places, it's legal to buy cannabis, but legally complicated to smoke it unless you own your own home. Um, as of now, there are only a few legal spots in the U.S. Um, in comparison where people can consume cannabis outside of their homes. And because there are no federal standards there either, all the various states and localities that have uh, legalized cannabis are coming up with their own rules and regulations, um, which is very similar to the situation in Canada at the moment, as I just mentioned that public consumption is a responsibility of provincial and municipal governments. But I mean, let's face it, as cannabis becomes more widely used and accepted socially, people are going to want public places to consume it just like alcohol. So um, we'll see what the future holds. Um, so following along those lines, in terms of the edibles, did you, had anyone noted the authorization of edibles and did it impact, I guess, the amount of consumption? And I think the follow-up to that is, you know, when you were talking with your KIs, did you find that, you know, in terms of authorizing, or I guess, approving edibles um, to be not appealing to children, yet you, you can't, people are able to produce candies and chocolate. Uh, do you find that, did anyone talk about that? discrepancy or that that difference and and how they're dealing with it Hi Jason are you still there Hello Sorry you cut out there for a second Sorry, just, I was just, I think for both of you, just talking about one question is really around the authorization of edibles and has it impacted, you know, levels of consumption. But I think the secondary is, you know, one of the, the legislation or what did people talk about, um, you know, they're allowed to produce candies and chocolate, but they also say not attractive to children. Um, it's sort of a bit of a contradictory. Did you hear that from people that were, um, that you talked to? Yeah, I did. There, there was some concern over, you know, there's a, there's a bit of, um, uh, it's confusing for some people because there are, you know, gummy bears available, there are candies available, and yet they're also trying to advocate for public health and safety. And at least in the um, proposed regulations from Health Canada, um, they stipulated that packaging will be plain. So plain packaging will be required. And I think that will make a big difference in preventing children from actually being attracted to some of these products. But the bigger problem is with homemade cannabis edibles, which present a unique challenge in my mind, because you know adult family members who make their own edible products are not required to follow the labeling, packaging, and uh, food safety standards that manufacturers and retail out outlets must adhere to. So this can put, uh, you know, household members of age and underage at risk. So I do think there's a really a, a big role um, in terms of public health. So the ca campaigns can enhance knowledge about homemade edibles, you know, associated risks, and hopefully provide guidelines for safe home cultivation and consumption. So <clears throat> with regards to, to the illegal market, did uh, that come up at all in your consultations in terms of people continuing to consume edibles or accessing edibles through the illegal market? So we did hear a few comments. So some are worried that the black market will continue to thrive if uh, strict regulations are imposed. And I think in California, this topic has been in the limelight recently. So you have industry experts that are saying that the illicit market continues to flourish. Um, and that it's difficult to navigate within the legal market because there's still so much competition from the black market. And I think it's important to listen to these concerns because you have people that are heavy users or consumers of THC and they may be able to ingest, you know, hundreds of milligrams of THC in a day. And clearly, if there are products available in the black market that are significantly cheaper and have a higher potency, these consumers will probably use illicit markets rather than uh, legal ones. So does that necessarily mean that we shouldn't impose stringent regulations? No, of course not. Um, in my mind, it's better to have a gradual incremental approach when it comes to edibles. 
And there will be so many novice users out there that will be trying edibles for the first time. It would be uh, much better to start with a low dosage to avoid putting people at risk. Um, but I think once governments have collected data um, and we have some strong evidence to suggest that the illicit market is still booming, then those regulations may have to be uh, reevaluated. I think Greg also Great. just so important to it's important to note um, that uh, that that balancing black market and the legal market this is something that's going to take uh, years and so looking at trends in the first year of legalization which is where California is, is at um, is really problematic so I think we just have to uh, keep uh, reminding um, ourselves that uh, these sorts of things do settle out over time or expected to um, and there are a lot more factors involved in terms of supply and demand and, and the marketing and uh, uh, balancing with the legal markets um, than we necessarily know at the beginning so again that precautionary approach is uh, I think one that's prudent here. This is going to go back a little bit in terms of towards the earlier part of the presentation, but I think Jason, you presented around some of the methods of consumption and timing. Um, one of the areas you didn't touch on was topicals and, and sort of the absorption time and, and rate, but also you give a little bit of perspective in terms of um, you know the different methods and sort of their onset time and then how long they last just a really quick overview of that again so could you go kind of go through smoking and then inhaling and then tinctures and versus like topicals yeah sure so to begin with topicals we we couldn't find any reliable information about you know onset of effects and duration and even with the oral mucosal administration that i mentioned so that involves like tinctures so when it's applied under the tongue under the tongue or in um, the linings of the cheek there really wasn't a lot of evidence out there so i was trying to be cautious when i made some of those statements earlier but um, in terms of liquid concentrates, which are often consumed through the oral mucosal administration or in when it's ingested, um, that's, that's completely different from when um, it's smoked or vaped, which involves the inhalation and exhalation of vapor. So they're just, they're going through different parts of the body. So they're affecting the body at a different rate. Um, and as I mentioned, there's really a paucity of research examining, you know, the onset and duration of effects after oral mucosal administration. Um, so from what we found, this method has similar effects to that ingestion, although at least in my opinion, it's still a gray area. And I'm really hoping that future data will give us a better idea of how oral mucosal administration and topical administration compares to ingestion and inhalation in the future. But if you um, want to hear specifically about inhalation versus ingestion again, um, yeah, so the the effect of uh, ingesting cannabis um, us usually takes um, a few hours to take effect. And then those effects last between four to 12 hours. In comparison with inhalation, um, effects can take, um, can occur in a few minutes and then usually last between two to four hours. Although again, it's important to remember that these times are approximate and can vary significantly um, depending on the consumer and the product being used. Great. Um, I will do a shameless plug here for CPHA. If you go to learning.cpha.ca, we do have the Canada Basics online learning, and one of the sections obviously is about the different methods of consumption and onset. Um, this sort of ties into your last point because I, you know, in my comment here is I understood that cannabis, unlike opioids, does not cause respiratory depression. Uh, this this wasn't reflected in your presentation today. Can you just clarify that? Yeah, I think specifically that question is referencing the potential effect in children. Um, you know, I couldn't bring up the study off the top of my head that uh, made those claims, but I can certainly look into it and then potentially the, the questioner or the questioner can ask you, uh, Greg, and I can get back to them. Yes, perfect. So everyone, if you do have questions for Michelle or you would like to follow up, you please send me an email. I'll have my email address at the end. And we can actually forward those on to Michelle and uh, Jason. Um,
So just to further questions, and then we've got about five more minutes, people. Do you, uh, so do you see cannabis beverages more problematic than other forms of cannabis? Um, do you see any specific issues related to those products? I, I don't think there's um, a big distinction between it's a, a type of edible. Obviously, there are um, parallels to public consumption um, patterns and so on um, that uh, would parallel alcohol, and, and that might in, impact uh, decision makers um, across the country in regards to you know some of their um, regulations in and around beverages versus solids. Um, but again, we're looking at um, you know a wide proliferation of edible products um, beyond just uh, the you know the candies, the the, the baking goods, and uh, beverages uh, that are just as much um, uh, gaining popularity. Um, prior to my next question, I actually would just like to point out something, and this is something that I have done in the past, and, and somebody has pointed out. I think it would be preferable for everybody to to use uh, the term illegal market and not black market. That is a colonizing term and a, uh, an inappropriate term. So um, I think that goes for all of our audience, if you could. And I thank you for having that pointed out. Um, is there any reason to believe the use of edibles will be patterned by socioeconomic status differently than would or does smoked cannabis? Mm, that's an interesting I, question. Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, yeah, I'm not aware of um, any specific studies in and around that. Again, uh, because we're kind of in our infancy with the uh, legal market, I think um, some of that research will be coming. We have great opportunity within Canada, uh, being that we're, you know, legalized federally, to look at these sorts of health equity questions over time. And in terms of uh, this question here, I skipped over by accident. But um, is there any jurisdiction that doesn't permit candies or familiar drinks or foods, and that you're aware of? Ooh, I'm trying to think back to the results now. Um, I think in some variation or another, they all they all did. And actually, I think we have. We'll take one more question here, folks. So the last one is: uh, I'm curious to know how cannabis edibles would be detected when crossing the border. Good question. <laughs> Do dogs? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that there is information in terms of on the Health Canada site and border services. Um, because in the U.S. it's federally regulated in terms of their border and it is illegal federally, I think if they found it, it would result in probably jail. And they may, may or may not have um, protection and a few other things. So I think um, I think that. I think the advice to anyone would be to not bring edibles regardless, either way. Um, no, so I want to, yeah, so uh, just before everyone leaves, we're just going to, I just want to say thank you to uh, Michelle and Jason for presenting this information. It's um, very timely and, and I think I know it's an area that a lot of people are very uh, concerned about and really thinking about. If you could just, we have a couple of quick exit polls here just to do that. I know early on you may have, you may have, uh, uh, thought about what other information you would like about edibles. So, um, and the other thing I would plug is the uh, we do have the weekly update where now we're moving to biweekly. If you would like to join that, and uh, we do have an online learning series around, and really around the basics of this. And, and one of the methods, obviously, is around uh, oral mucosal and ingested, which is I think really important. So. Um, if you, yes, thank you, Michelle and Jason. It's very informative and we really appreciate your time.